when the Second World War ended in 1945, there was great hope that with the formation of the United Nations, we would find the right formulas to reduce armed conflict in the world. But the sad truth is that the United Nations has failed uh, in its primary aim to maintain peace and security by preventing armed conflict. And since the founding of the, U the UN, hundreds of armed conflicts have decimated populations and drained national treasuries all over the world. But armed conflicts are apparently on the way from figures that we have from 44 armed conflicts worldwide in 1995, they were down to 28 in 2009 and 24 in 2010. So there's a little hope there. But the profit motive of the military industrial complex and the mindset of resolving conflict military remain, remain dominant. The major powers, particularly the United States of America, have militarized diplomacy and the contagion has spread to other states. However, the global financial crisis and economic recession appear to have marginally restrained levels of military spending. And you will probably see that in the latest CIPRI report which came out today. Now in 2005, the International Peace Bureau initiated a program on sustainable development, sorry, sustainable disarmament for sustainable development. And it focused on the following, reducing military spending in favor of increased investment in sustainable development and climate change mitigation by abolishing or mitigating the effects of some weapons systems on communities in conflict zones. Addressing militarism, the militarization of economic aid, and the spread of military bases in areas with intense resource competition. Now, in 2010, world military expenditure soared to 1.63 trillion US dollars. 1.63. And this is the equivalent to 2.6% of global gross domestic product, or 236 US dollars per person. Now, an average of more than 24,000 children under the age of five every day die from preventable causes. Lack of access to adequate food, clean water, and basic medicines. And they are paying the price of collateral damage, arising from the global mindset of maintaining armed forces in a state of combat readiness around the world. Now this rise in military expenditure in 2010 was almost entirely due to the United States, no surprise, which over the period 2001 to 2010 increased its military expenditure by 81% compared to 32% in the rest of the world. America's maintenance of 761 U.S. military bases in 156 countries worldwide and its war on terror are extremely costly policies. Today, the Stockholm International Peace and Research Institute, or SIPRI, published its yearbook, which declared that world military expenditure in 2011 stood at 1.738 trillion dollars. Now measured in real terms, this figure is just about 0.3% higher than in 2010. 
In other words, military expenditure in 2011 was essentially unchanged, in breaking a 13-year run of continuous increases in military spending. Every year, when you look at the CIPRI report, you expect to see a jump in military spending. But this year, there's a little hope, and perhaps it's the economic uh, consequences. And unsurprisingly, the top 10 spenders were the United States, China, Russia, United Kingdom, France, Japan, India, Saudi Arabia, Germany, and Brazil. And yet millions of people all over the world continue to call on their governments to end the squandering of taxes on armaments and to commit to investing in healthcare, education, and other social services as part of the UN Millennium Development Goals. The main thrust of the Millennium Development Goals is fighting poverty, building democratic societies, crisis prevention and recovery, protecting the environment, halting and reversing HIV AIDS, empowering women, and building national capacity. And these goals are also basic human rights, the right of each person to health, education, shelter, and security, as pledged in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Whatever one's motivation, whether it be human rights, religious values, common security, economic prudence, or political ideology, practical solutions for resolving extreme poverty do exist, although political will is weakening in the face of the ongoing global economic crises. In 1953, you will remember this famous saying of President Eisenhower when he reminded the world that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed and those who are cold and not clothed. Now let's look briefly at the Malaysia's military-industrial political complex. And I like to think of it as not only a military-industrial complex, but as a military-industrial political complex. And you've heard some of the speakers before me talk about what that really means. Now military spending is an intricate subject with many hidden national and international dimensions, such as the incestuous and corrupt relationship between buyers and sellers of arms, between the arms industry, the military and politicians, regional and global tensions between states, seeking a military solution to the war on terror, and protecting so-called national interests, such as access to minerals and energy sources. Many countries, including Malaysia, have a robust military-industrial political complex, as you've heard, where the interface between military personnel, businessmen, and politicians creates a power elite who are not averse to the diversion of national resources to substantial military spending in the name of national security and military modernization catchwords for justifying military expenditure. The Malaysian Parliament is known for its brevity in approving military expenditure with little or no meaningful debate, transparency or accountability. I'm sure Tony Park is well aware of that. Military expenditure enriches and empowers a specially favored group of companies engaged in the production and sale of armaments and military equipment. Wealthy and well-connected arms lobbyists are known to exert a strong influence on deal-making. 
in Malaysia, the concentration of power in the hands of few UMNO leaders in the executive branch of government and the influence of top military personnel have paved the way for the development of a growing domestic military industrial political complex. Now let's look briefly at the military expenditure in Malaysia. Despite the zone of peace, freedom and neutrality of ZOCFAN, non-aligned policies, regional integration and public utterances of friendship and cooperation, ASEAN countries have tended to increase their military spending, as you have heard. And such spending is inclined to create regional insecurity and to stimulate more spending. And this escalation in so-called defence spending will continue in the absence of a coherent multilateral security framework and a coordinated arms control mechanism including an ASEAN register of conventional arms which would increase transparency and engender a sense of trust within ASEAN. Now we've all seen and perhaps read Kya Sun's recent book Questioning Arms Spending in Malaysia and you will find that it highlights numerous scandals linked to military spending. The book points to lack of transparency and accountability in decision-making, which often leads to questionable, unjustified excesses in defense procurements. As in many other countries, vested interests and profitable margins influence decision-making, particularly in the absence of genuine democratic processes and a free, independent press, which we lack in this country. For example, in the KL Defence Fair in April 2010, the Malaysian government spurred 10.4 billion ringgit, an amount that could have been used to build 1,000 hospitals, or 1,000 new schools, or 100,000 new houses. And for the 10th Malaysia Plan, 2011 to 2015, the government has allocated 23 billion ringgit for defense and security. The procurement of armaments, especially combat aircraft and submarines, does not come cheaply and is often solid by scandals and corruption in high places. For example, a single American F-2 F-22 Raptor aircraft would cost 160 million US dollars. The Malaysian government's scandalous purchase of two Scorpion class submarines in 2002, which we have think we should be talking about, from a French company, DCNS, costing more than 7 billion ringgit, continues to rumble in the public domain. Now, DCNS, formerly known as Direction des Constructions Navales, is a French naval defense company, one of Europe's leading shipbuilders based in France. And the acronym DCN has now been replaced by the brand name DCNS. Now, this company, which designs, builds, and supports surface combat vessels, submarines, systems, and equipment, is also expanding into new markets such as civil nuclear energy, marine renewable energy, and naval and industrial services. There has been talk that France will provide Malaysia's first two nuclear reactors. And I think this is something that the people of Malaysia will have to resist with all its might. In 2010, French prosecutors launched investigations into a number of corruption charges, including bribery and kickbacks against top French officials involved in different submarine sales. And they were particularly interested in purchase of Scorpion-class submarines by India and Malaysia. The investigation in Malaysia was prompted by the Malaysian human rights group, Swaram, as you've heard, who was concerned that the purchase of the two submarines was put together in 2002 during the tenure 
of the then Defence Minister, now Prime Minister, Najib to Raza. And as a result of this deal, 3.7 billion ringgit in permission was paid to Abdul Razak Baginda, a close associate of Najib. Purchase of, this, of these submarines was made through a Malaysian company named Perimeka, which was owned by Abdul Razak Baginda. And Perimeka received a huge fee of, believe it or not, 510 million ringgit of commission, and this amounted to 11% of the sales price of the submarines. Now, French investigators are intrigued by the facts that Perinaka was formed only a few months before the contract was signed between the Malaysian government and DCNS, and that Perinaka had no track record in servicing submarines and did not have the financial means to support the contract. A French legal team that filed complaints in the Paris court over the billion dollar purchase of the submarines visited Malaysia in April of 2010 to seek further information on the case. And I hope they were successful. But it was more than just the enormous cost of the submarines that raised eyebrows and embarrassed the Malaysian government and its prime minister. The whole scorpion scandal seemed to mimic a James Bond film, a love affair between a good-looking man and a beautiful Mongolian woman who was later murdered by two former bodyguards of a prominent politician and close associate of her lover, with several twists and turns, including the nature of the killing and disposal of the body, the undetermined motive for the murder, and the dramatic reversal of a statutory declaration by a private investigator who has fled the country and disappeared from view. And although two men with faces covered during the trial have been convicted of murder in a court of law and sentenced to death, most people are unhappy with the outcome, which has left many questions unanswered. And so the Malaysian public awaits the outcome of the judicial review of the allegations of bribery and corruption in a French court of law and the likely political repercussions. And I think we're going to learn more about the Scorpion scandal from the inquiries in France than we will ever hear about it in this country. And so looking back on the state of this country, on the state of the world today, I think we have essentially a problem with the quality of leadership, not just in this country, but all over the world. There is, I think, a crisis of good ethical leadership. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? We in Malaysia have had the same government for more than 50 years. We know that this government is corrupt, it's arrogant, and it's fat. We know that we do not have a democratic political structure, although we are trying to make changes in the electoral process, which I hope will succeed. But the next elections, I think, is going to be a very, very dirty election, because there is a lot at stake. If the Bayesan government loses out, it can look forward to perhaps the consequences that we've seen in countries in the Middle East. So I think it is really, this election is really a kind of fight to the death. Because if the Barisan government is defeated, the chances are that some of these, some of the members of government will find themselves in prison. We have, no, we have a media that is controlled 
but that has been offset to a certain extent by the freedom in the internet. And perhaps that is what was one of the factors that we had a good election result in 2008. So there are many changes that we have to make in this country. It's an uphill struggle. And I think the only way we can make these important changes is by changing the government. So please register and please vote. Thank you.